Sir Andrew, thanks for speaking with me today. Now, you came into the role of Chief Exec of NICE after a long career with the NHS. So what did that teach you around the role that NICE had to play in regulating healthcare costs? Well, I'm still in the NHS. I'm still in my NHS career. NICE is part of the National Health Service. And it was never our brief to save money. Um, though in the time, the years that I was running hospitals, which is the career I had before I joined NICE, I learned a lot about squaring the circle locally. And that is important experience to carry into NICE, an organisation that has the job of guiding the NHS in using its resources effectively. I've got quite a lot of experience of being on the receiving end of well-meaning national bodies. Um, but our job here isn't to reduce costs. Our job is to help the NHS make the best use of its resources and to guide health professionals and patients in understanding the optimal use of new treatments and new forms of practice. And it's probably fair to say that NICE has had its fair share of advocates and critics in fairly equal measure. But as an organisation coming up to its 13th birthday, what do you think has been key to its longevity? 13 years is quite a long time for a national agency supporting the NHS. And you don't continue for that length of time without doing something that the NHS regards as being valuable. That's the critical thing. What we do in interpreting evidence in clinical practice and in public health is to put decision makers and the people for whom they're making decisions, all of us who rely on the NHS for our care, in a much better place to understand uh, what's going to offer the best chance for the best outcomes, as well as providing the NHS with a steer on the optimal use of the resources it has available. A lot of talk is around the NHS reforms at the moment. Now, assuming those are implemented, what effect do you think that will have on the way that NICE operates? Well, we know that the proposals um, in the bill are that uh, NICE forms a close relationship with the NHS Commissioning Board, which will have a significant influence on the NHS facing products that come out of NICE. Obviously, in addition to that, we, we're going to support Public Health England, we're going to support local government with its new lead responsibility for public health. And of course, we've got an important new role subject to legislation in social care, producing standards for those people who are working, who are delivering services, and people who are relying on social care. And the opportunity to produce social care standards is really exciting, it provides us with a chance to bring together what we know uh, represents effective practice in health, social care, and public health. Now, many of the negative headlines tend to focus on decisions NICE has made around not recommending end-of-life treatment, say, terminal cancer medications. So how does NICE look and compare between those kind of treatments and those for more chronic, long-term diseases? Well, it's true that our advice on new pharmaceuticals is uh, the story is often forms the headlines, though it's only a small part of what NICE does, if you look right across the range of programmes that we're offering in the NHS and to um, public health. But our approach to looking at the effectiveness of anything is to get all the evidence on what we're using at the moment, uh, what we know about its contribution to good outcomes, and then set that side by side with what we know about a new intervention or a new form of practice and do our best to identify the difference. And where there is an incremental benefit, there mostly is, of something new being introduced into the system. Then we have to make that difficult judgment about whether that incremental benefit is worth what the NHS is being asked to pay for it. And it's often that judgment that's the controversial one. And we take great care over it. We spent a long time through the years that we've been in operation uh, reviewing and revising our approach to understanding value from new pharmaceuticals, from medical devices, from different forms of practice, and being able to make a very careful assessment of what that means for patients. And that's at the heart of what we do. It's where we start and we keep the benefits to patients of the th new things that we're looking at uh, in the center of our attention as we're making these judgments. And then we open ourselves to why consultation. We open ourselves to challenge. That's really important. We don't have a monopoly on wisdom. Um, the more we talk to people, the more we provide those who are affected by our decisions with the opportunity to talk to us about um, the judgments that we've made and the consequences for them, the better the guidance is ultimately.
And as the pharma industry has become more familiar with the way that NICE operates, have you seen the quality of submissions actually improve? Yes, in general, I think they have. Companies are more familiar now with what NICE needs. And of course, some companies have been through the NICE appraisal process many times, so they'll be very familiar with the, effective, the most effective way of presenting the um, data that they have available. It's very important that they give us all the information that they have available, and it's really important that they present that in a way, in the way that we've asked, because that puts our appraisal committees in the best possible position to make a judgment about the incremental benefit and therefore the clinical and cost effectiveness of the new treatment. And we've become better too at doing that uh, as we've reviewed our methods and processes through the years in conjunction with the industry amongst others. Um, we've now got um, a better decision framework than we have when we started. Now very recently it was reported that Sir Andrew Whitty, the chief exec of GlaxoSmithKline, had suggested there were systematic delays with the introduction of new cancer medications in the UK. What would your response be to that? I don't really know what he was referring to in, in um, his reference to delays. We've gradually speeded up um, the process of um, responding to the referrals that we have from the Department of Health to give advice on new drugs for treating cancer. Um, the elapsed time between a marketing authorization for any drug, including those licensed for treating cancer, and NICE guidance come out has dropped dramatically over the last six years as we've become better along with our colleagues at the department in identifying those drugs that we need to provide guidance on and putting in additional resources and just becoming more efficient at the whole process of appraising new drugs. So now um, it's a matter of um, a few months between a marketing authorization um, and at the very least nice draft guidance being issued. I'm conscious though there remain challenges and circumstances in which our guidance is, isn't what Andrew Whitty um, or in some other circumstances chief executives of other pharmaceutical companies would want. Um, but that's the nature of the work we do, that critical assessment of those additional benefits. It's at the heart of what we do and in those circumstances when you do that, it's inevitable there'll be occasions when the guidance isn't as positive as people might want. Mm -hmm.